Good afternoon, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we're going to be looking at Song of Solomon chapter 2. Song of Solomon chapter 2. Just like yesterday, we're going to go verse by verse through it. We're going to look at all the explanation of what it means. And then at the very end, after we've done all eight chapters, we'll go back through it again. We'll look at a complete overview and then we'll start really breaking out some pieces to get some more divine revelation from God. So Song of Solomon chapter 2, let me pray first and then we'll get started. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. Let our eyes be open to see, our ears be open to hear, our hearts be able to receive the word of life, spiritual seed sown inside of our heart, growing up, changing our life, our mind, our will, and emotion, conforming us and transforming us into the image of Christ. God, we love you, we thank you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. His left hand is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is, is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, Thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved. And be thou like a row or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethur. So church, we're just going to go right through it because I want to make sure we have enough time to read all these verses. So let's start today and we're going to start with verse 1. I am the rose of Sharon and the lilies of the valley. Well, the rose represents the love. It's in the plane of fertility. It's this, it's this true affection. I have true affection and love. The lily represents the purity in the valleys of a dark world. So you have two different things being explained here in verse 1. I, I, I have love for you, true fertile love for you, but also it's purity. It also defines as love and obedience towards God. Verse 2, as the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. The lily, like I said, representing purity, is representing purity and dedication toward Jesus in the midst of the sins of the fallen world. Among the thorns, the lily among the thorns, the purity and dedication among these thorns, among the entire world, this is what my love is. Verse 3, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. Now, Jesus is the great refreshing. The apples is what it's referring to, the refreshingness of them. Among the great men of the earth, which is represented of the trees that it's speaking of. The trees of the wood is also a representation of a dense forest of rugged, rough country, but has no fruit. His shadow represents his protection, and the fruit is the satisfaction this is a depiction of the cross. Church, this is a powerful point here. Do not miss verse 3. It's the depiction of the things of this world, the men of this world, the, 
the delights and the wine of the world, all the things that are a part of it is, is wood. It's what's called dense forest, dense foliage. It's rough country, but there's no fruit there. The difference being the contrast of Jesus being the apple tree, the refreshing tree that is sweet to the taste. It is, it is delightful to be under his shadow. It is the, the shadow of his wings. It's the protection that comes from being with the Lord. Verse 4, he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. Now we see a shift where she is taken from under the tree and taken into the banqueting house. So you see a, a shift in location. So that's just something to note. But the first part is he brought me to it. His leadership to bring to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the end goal. But he is bringing her into the house to sit and eat with him. It's this banqueting house. It's where he is going to fill us. It's where he's going to sustain us. It's where he's going to... Uh, put the revelation and the wisdom and the knowledge on the inside of us as he feeds us with his word. But his banner over me was love. Now banners in the Old Testament, when coming with uh, an army, was a representation of coming back from victory. The banner wasn't going to war, the banner was coming back from war, back in victory. That's when the banners were used. So this banner of love is this banner of victory that the Lord has over you for the battle already being won. This is also uh, the same type of phrase used when it talks about when Moses called him Je Jehovah Nisi. It's the banner of victory when he held up the rod and the children of Israel won in battle. The th he named the Lord. He said, you are Jehovah Nisi, the banner of victory. It's the banner of love. It's the banner saying it's already finished. He's already saying the battle's won. He is the finished work. Verse 5. Stay me with flagons. Comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Now, there's a lot of different phrases in this one. Stay me with flagons. Comfort me with apples. Now, that's two different phrases. And then you have, for I am sick of love. So let me rest in your sacrifice and spread me out of ref and spread me out of refreshment when we with your word. You need to look at Proverbs 25:11 to get the spread out of the word. That's what comes from the apples. But this stay me with flagons. The flagons, what that is, is rice cakes or raisin cakes, raisin cakes. Those were used. Those raisin cakes were used in sacrificial atonement. That, that's what was used as a, it's a refreshment, but it's a refreshment used in the sacrificial sense. So stay me or um, let me rest, that's also what it means, is let me rest in the burial or the sacrificial atonement that you did. So stay me with flagon is the rest in the finished work of what you did on the cross. Because remember, this is a representation of Jesus. That's, that's the spiritual interpretation that we're looking at. But stay me with flagons is the rest and the burial atonement. It's the sacrificial offering of him. And then you have the comfort me with apples, which is spread me out or, or, or refresh me with the word. Apples is also a representation of the Word of God. So you have two different things being said here. It's that in the banqueting house, because remember I was brought into the banqueting house, there's two things. I'm resting in your finished work, and then I'm also refreshed by your Word. Two different things depicted here. Now people also use the raising cakes as a depiction of the Holy Spirit. And then the apples being a representation of Jesus, having both at the same time. I see the rest of the raisin cakes, or staying me with flagons, the rest in the finished work of the sacrificial offering of Jesus being the first part, and then the second part being the comfort of the apples or the refreshment as we are spread out, as we are opened up and filled, refreshed by the Word of God. And then sick of love is pain by anything that would get in the way of your love. That's what Mike Bickle defines it as. Me, 
I define it as having adoration or affection to the degree it makes you grieve to be without Jesus. So you just have to have it. You can't live without it. Verse 6. His left hand is under my head. His right hand doth embrace me. Now, there's a couple different things that are explained here. The first part, I like to explain this where Solomon wrote Proverbs also. That the left hand is referred to as riches and honor. And the right hand is referred to as length of days. Now, we're going to come back to that in just a second. So just hold that thought. But the left also is referred to the hand that is wrapped up, where the right hand is used for pledging faithfulness of promises. So you have this left hand that's behind your head that refers to the riches and honor, which also deals with the rest. It's the things you can't see. And then the right hand that embraces you is the length of days. So you see two different aspects of God being faithful to his promise when it comes to the length of days or him being with you always, never leaving you, and the rest of him providing for you, the riches and honor that goes behind your head. It's the things that you can't see that God supernaturally provides for you. This is what allows you to rest in him. If you're going to rest in his sacrifice and be refreshed with his word, because you're so sick of love for him and you're in his house when he goes to embrace you and allows you to take this rest and to lay down it comes from the things that you can't see that he supernaturally provides for you the riches and honor and then also the embrace of you could the, the embrace that he puts around you as he wraps his arms around you knowing that he's pledging long life this faithfulness to never leave you Let's go on to verse 7. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Now, the daughters of Jerusalem are always referred to as the immature believers throughout this story. So just know that. And this is a command to them. Now, the rose and the hind of the field represent animals that are easily startled or distracted. Now, the rose and the hinds. The rows are representations also of gazelles, which are in the field, and the hinds are representation of deer, but it's female deer, it's the doe. So we're referring to the female side of this. Just hold tight, because we're gonna come back to that point in just a second. So you have the, she's referring to herself as the, as the female side, that you stir not up, that you do not disrupt my love, and if this word he, he could be also substituted for she, that till he please is a verb. So what it's saying is until the time in which my love is ready, don't awake me, don't stir me, don't move me, don't arouse me because my love is easily startled. I, I'm still very immature in my relationship with God. So don't push me. I'm trying to be refreshed. I'm trying to rest. I'm trying to learn the word. So don't, don't arouse me until it's time. The vo verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. So it's just something to recognize is she calls him, Jesus, her beloved. The bride is calling him her beloved. So that is, this is a sign of adoration and affection. This isn't fake love. This is real love. It might be immature, but it is sincere. The love is real. Leaping and skipping across refers to the conquering victory of Christ over all situations. He's going over the mountains, over the hills. There's nothing high nor low that Jesus has not conquered. Verse 9. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. Now, the roe or the young heart is a comparison to the hind of the field as she describes in verse 7. In verse 7, she said, rose hinds a field, referring in the feminine sense. Rose, our young heart, is referred to the masculine sense, one that is not afraid, one that will fight. Deer that are feminine, does run. But male deer, with their big horns, they buck, they fight. If you stir them up, they are going to come back. It's this masculine, mature love. And then him standing is an indication of action. 
Now, Jesus is usually referred to as sitting, but even like when uh, Stephen was stoned, Jesus arose to receive him. So if Jesus is standing, this is a depiction that action is coming. He's at the wall. The wall is a representation of the, of the standing of action. Jesus is at this wall. And she called, she called them not to disturb her, but he's about to call her out. He's standing. The action is about to come. We see Jesus looking through the windows. He's showing himself. He's trying to get her attention because he's about to call her out. This wall was built so that she could sit there and receive and grow up in maturity in God. That's why she said, don't disturb me. This wall is there. And Jesus is looking through the wall. He's standing. He's ready. He's about to call her out. My beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. This is verse 10. So we see this transition of season where Jesus beckons us to get us to follow him into a deeper relationship and work with him. He's saying, rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. So stand up. It's time to not sit anymore, and it's time to come away. It's time to move. You need to start walking. This, this time of growing in the banqueting house as you're, as you're resting in my sacrifice and being refreshed by my word it's time that now it's time to rise up. It's time to get to work. And he is beckoning her to come with him. This is another point just to understand. He's not saying go by yourself. He is beckoning her to come with him. Verse 11, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. This is the first declaration that the dark and rainy season is over. That season is done. You need to understand if Jesus speaks something, he's telling you the truth. So if he says it's done, you could rest and follow him. because He just said, follow me. That's done. You're going to see in just a second that she's still stuck there, even though she, she got to believe when Jesus said that season's over, that season's over. Verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing birds is come and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. So the proclamation that the flower of the or the blossoming of your heart is now seen in the land and in others. The flower represents the blossoming of the heart, the readiness of not only her, but the land itself. So he's calling her out. He's saying it's time to go to work. The, stu the, the harvest, and we're about to see that in a second too, is ready. The flower is blossomed. The time of singing of birds has come, of birds is added in, but it's singing is come also refers to pruning that word is pruning so the time is at hand for the pruning of the relation of, of the heart so your relationship is gone you you've been satisfied in the banqueting house the season is over come with me it's time to prune and he also says the turtle is heard in our land the voice of the turtle refers to the thundering call to sacrificial living it's, it's this sacrificial, the turtle dove is this, used in sacrifices. He's calling her to be pruned and to live as a sacrifice, to give up her will and choose his. The fig tree putteth forth green, her green furs, figs, and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The fig tree and the vine represent that the harvest is ready. The harvest is ready to go. A fig tree, when it puts forth its leaves and its figs, go at the same time. His call to her is action to labor with him. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. He is calling her into the harvest to do labor with him. Verse 14, O oh, my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. So we see he starts affirming her by referring to her as a dove, the purity and loyalty that comes with being a dove. Jesus is also calling her from the place of refuge and comfort. The clefts of the rock, the secret place of the stairs. The first part is the refugee, and the second part is the comfort, the covering of it. But he's trying to beckon her out. He wants to see the emotion in the voice because it's pleasant and beautiful to him. He's saying, you are beautiful. You are pleasant to me. I want you to do this work with me. I see that you're there. You're in this refuge spot as you're, as you're hiding, as you're in support. But he's calling you out of that place 
to go with him. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines tender grapes. Now she's speaking again, and she's making a proclamation saying that the foxes are dealed with the things that are burrowed, are buried deep down inside. We can call those bound, the strongholds, and they are what corrupt the vine. They're the cunning craftiness that eat the grapes at night. It's the strongholds inside of us that are buried deep down. Our relationship with God is still new and tender. We need His help to get these strongholds out. She's saying, I need help. You're beckoning me out into this deep relationship, into the harvest. And she's calling herself tender grapes. My love is tender. It's still new. I know you're beckoning me. I'm sincere with this. And we're about to see that in a second. But I need help that these things that are inside of me, you need to help get them out of me. She said, my beloved is mine and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. This is very sincere love, yet it's very immature. And we see this, as we'll see later on in the song, that she says, my beloved is mine, I am his. She starts by claiming him and then giving herself. At the end of the Song of Solomon, she said, I am my beloved and his desire is toward me. She acknowledges giving herself first, then receiving him. Here she is receiving him first, then giving herself. It's still very immature love because she thinks about her own self first. But feedeth among the lilies is talking about Jesus is wanting to sustain us by the purity, which means the strongholds must go. She's asking for this help to get the strongholds out because she acknowledges that where he feeds needs purity, which means these strongholds have to go. That's why this is very immature, yet very sincere love. It's, I know I have these things buried inside of me, and I know that where you feed, these cannot be. That's why I need help. And then the most heartbreaking part is verse 17. Until the daybreak and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of beth -er. In this weakness and immaturity, where she has these strongholds, these foxes, and she knows that Jesus feeds where there's purity, where there's lilies, where there's not that, she tells him to go without her. The fear of... This driving factor of fear is what's causing the separation. That's Bethair. That's what it's talking about, these mountains of separation between her and God. She knows it's coming. It's not rebellion. She just needs time because she's not realizing that if she goes, he will sustain. And this is, this is the truth of what it means to obey God, that she's at the banqueting house. She's being sustained by the sacrificial offering of Jesus. She's being refreshed by his word. She's in true adoration and affection towards him, and he's calling her out of that. And when he calls her out of that, he tells her what to do and then affirms her that she can, telling her it's over, the season is over. But she looks at herself, and she sees these strongholds, these foxes in her, and she's calling out for help because she knows those have to leave because where Jesus feeds is purity. It does not have those. And in that moment of immaturity and weakness and fear, it causes her to tell him to leave and go without her. She chooses not to obey, not in rebellion, but in immaturity. And because of that, the separation comes. She knows that there's going to be separation because of that, but she, she just is afraid of it. And this shows the difference between a rebellious person and a very immature believer. Because she's still growing to try to understand that when Jesus said the season is over, that the season was over. That it was time that she, if she would just walk, go with him, he would sustain it. But she's still very immature to not understand that yet. And this is chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. And church, we're going to be doing this every single day until we go through all of the chapters and like I said, we're going to go back, we're going to give a huge overview, we're going to go back into these chapters and explain some of these topics some more. But what I want you to do is just sit and meditate and really start to see the progression of maturity in the believer that comes through the Song of Solomon. So Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let the word come alive. I pray wisdom revelation to everybody that the word comes alive in us and in our relationship with you. God, we love you and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, have a wonderful day today. Please make sure you like, 
you follow, you share. Please make sure you share it with all your friends. And come back tomorrow as we study chapter 3 of the Song of Solomon. Have a great day.